Hey, welcome and good afternoon, everybody. I'm Brian Kuhn. I'm the NEMA president and director of the Florida Division of Emergency Management. I'm the moderator for today's webinar uh, entitled Crude by Rail Emergency Preparedness. Thank you all for joining us. I want to welcome our two presenters today, David Willauer and John Steinauer. Uh, I'm going to read both their bios here, tell you a little bit more about them. David Willauer is the manager of transportation technological hazards at IEM. He's current vice chair of the Transportation Research, Research Board Committee on Transportation of Hazardous Materials and current chair of the TRB Subcommittee on Crude Oil Transportation. Uh, the subcommittee was formed in June 2014 in response to significant national increases in crude by rail and the need for additional research on crude oil transportation by motor carrier, rail, pipeline, and barge. Mr. Willara has 25 years of experience with transportation, land use, and emergency planning including evacuation studies, commodity flow studies of hazardous materials, transportation corridor plans, port security plans, and hazmat risk assessments. He studied hazardous materials, commodity flows in multiple states, including North Carolina, Delaware, Maine, and Louisiana. He is a seasoned mariner and licensed captain for up to 100 ton vessels and previously served as the planning director for the Council of Governments in Portland, Maine. Our second presenter today is John Steinauer. He is an IEM Senior Technological Hazards Planner, has 28 years of experience in multi-hazard emergency response, and has responded to over 1,000 emergencies. Mr. Steinar has particular expertise in hazardous material incidents. For seven years, he was HAZMAT Team Leader for the Lincoln-Lancaster County, Nebraska Health Department, serving as Incident Commander or Safety Officer for many hazardous materials, radiological or other public health emergencies in the county. For nine years, he was vice chair of the Nebraska State Emergency Response Commission. As technical hazard planning program manager for North Carolina's Division of Emergency Management, Mr. Steinauer designed and implemented the state's technical hazard mitigation plan and coordinated with the U.S. Chemical Safety Board and North Carolina Department of Environment and Natural Resources to investigate toxic chemical release incidents in North Carolina. He has presented at more than 240 local, state, national, and international forums on chemical hazard risk management and emergency response. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our speakers and then at the end of their presentation I will be moderating the questions that you all submit on the website. So David and John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brian, for those kind introductions. Um, and thank you, uh, Karen, on behalf of, of NEMA for your uh, for, for sponsoring this. I got involved in uh, in this topic about about two and a half years ago, I was sitting at a meeting at a CERC meeting in, uh, in the East Coast, and there was a rail carrier and a, and a, and a refiner in the meeting um, negotiating uh, a new arrangement. And I, and I got to thinking about the implications of a unit train of crude oil transiting East Coast cities and what that might mean for emergency response. And so I proposed the idea in a workshop later that year, and I was told, uh, Mr. Willauer, crude oil is really not that significant a hazard, and we don't think it's really all that much of an issue, so you should try another topic. And uh, not three weeks later, the, uh, the Lac Megantique disaster occurred on July 6th, changing that little town forever in, uh, in Quebec, in which those, that runaway train uh, derailed and, and killed 47 people. So it was a real game changer for emergency response. And uh, today's webinar uh, is, is going to give you an overview of, of some of the industry trends, the federal response, and some incidents that we've heard about uh, in recent months. We've been tracking these uh, since they first started occurring two and a half years ago. Rail tank car behaviors and pool fires, uh, some recommendations, and uh, some sample industry-based studies, and John's going to present the uh, recommendations for you. So um, in terms of federal preparedness and response, we'll be looking at the TRB crude oil subcommittee and some slides on DOT rulemaking. You've probably seen this map before. The U.S. shale oil revolution has really resulted in a significant increase in the production of shale oil, and shale oil is also known as tight oil. You may have heard that term before, tight oil is like oil you're extracting from tight places. That's how I think of shale oil. And if you look on this map in the middle of, of, of North Dakota, extending into Canada, is the Bakken oil fields. Those are the most widely publicized oil fields. But 
over the past 10 years, there's really been a, an evolution of shale production in, in the United States, starting in Barnett, Texas. If you look at the timeline on the right, um, Arkansas, North Dakota, the Neo Brara oil field in Colorado, Eagle Ford, Texas, and, uh, and recently the Permian Basin. So the, the geography of these shale oil production areas have led to a question about how to get the oil to refineries. And even though in recent months the rig count has been down for crude oil, the production is still up and we're still seeing significant production of crude oil. Uh, so how do you get to the refineries? Let's go to the next slide and, um, and look at the crude oil refineries in the United States. Don't forget we have some in Canada too, so bear in mind that we have additional refineries in St. John, New Brunswick to the east, Edmonton to the west, and in Montreal. But if you look at this map, it's no surprise that over 50% of our refineries in the U.S. are based in the Gulf. And that, that oil refinery capacity in the Gulf relies on heavy oil, uh, not as much light oil, whereas the east and west coast refineries rely on light oil. So the Bakken crude, which is light oil, needs to get to these east and west coast refineries to be able to be uh, processed for market. And, and there is no significant pipeline infrastructure to the east coast and the west coast yet. We have good infrastructure on pipelines to the Gulf Coast, out of Canada, down through uh, Chicago, the Midwest, and down to the Gulf Coast. But the pipeline network does not extend east and west yet. And that's the reason why the North American railroads have come into play as a significant transporter of crude oil. I'll, I'll, I'll say one more remark about this map. You notice the map's organized into districts. These are called PADs, or Petroleum Area Defense Districts. And there's, there's five of them, as you can see, in the U.S. And the organization called the uh, U.S. Energy Information Administration uh, has, a, has a great series of um, of uh, data sets online that you can get, now including crude by rail, that is organized by PAD districts. So you can do some research yourself on where the oil is moving. So let's look at how the oil gets to the east and west coast. If I could have the next slide, please. We'll take a look at the North American uh, Railroad Network. On the eastern side, you've got CSX and Norfolk Southern in the, in the black and blue lines, uh, occupying areas to the east of the Mississippi. Uh, to the west of the Mississippi, you have uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, BNSF, and uh, Union Pacific. Canadian National and Canadian Pacific are, are the red and blue lines at the top. And notice how Canadian National extends all throughout Canada down to the Gulf of uh, Mexico. Uh, and so basically, the BNSF is really uh, transporting most of this crude by rail of all these providers. Um, Remember that railroads don't own their own tank cars. They're leased by third parties. So when, when, uh, when you think of these unit trains, these are actually leased unit trains, leased by the suppliers. And there's been a tremendous expansion as a result. Um, from 2009, 2008-2009, all the way to 2014, we had a 4,000% increase in crude by rail from 8,000 carloads a year all the way up to over 4,030 carloads a year. And so it was a, a significant increase. And, and while that's dropped in the first two quarters of 2015, uh, production still continues to rise. And remember, those east and west coast refineries still need to get the crude oil. And, and they're trying to get it using rail. How does the rail get there? It's transported in unit trains. And the definition of a unit train is that the same product is shipped from origin to destination on, on one train. So sometimes you see um, 100 to 150 cars in one train. That would be considered a unit train. How long will the railroad ship this shale oil? Let's take a look at the next slide to talk a little bit about shale oil. Shale oil, which is uh, <clears throat> also known as tight oil, I told you before, is, um, is showing some remarkable um, outlooks for, for beyond uh, 2000. Uh, this is to 2040. Another chart here from the U.S. <clears throat> Energy Information Administration shows that in yellow, the tight oil is this significant amount at the top. Uh, the, the bottom colors represent the, uh, uh, the lower 48 
offshore and lower 48 onshore, and the, you can see the Alaska totals are diminishing as well. So because the Alaskan amounts are no longer as viable for the Californian and West Coast refineries, they're looking to this shale oil to supplement uh, the Alaskan and other lower 48 oil. Uh, <clears throat> a little bit about exporting, there's been some, some relaxing of the export bans to uh, recently to Mexico. We're now exporting some light oil to Mexico in exchange for heavy oil. Um, we're also exporting condensate, which is a very light oil, um, the lightest of all oils, to Canada. And they're using that to mix as a diluent with the tar sands and piping it back to the U.S. So the, the composition of this oil, whether it's light or heavy, has a lot to do about refining. And so uh, I want to share with you a little bit about light and heavy oil on the next slide. Uh, crude oil classification is, is pretty interesting uh, because it's, it's actually um, not as simple as, 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 you, as you might expect. Um, light oil, which is considered light because it has light ends in it, like propane and butane and other natural gas liquids, whereas heavy oil is heavy because of its, its weight. And the American Petroleum Institute has developed a formula which is called API gravity. And basically API gravity is a measure that compares liquid petroleum density to water. So the higher the API gravity, the higher, uh, the, the lighter the crude oil, and the lower the API gravity, the heavier the crude oil. So the Bakken oil that we're talking about, West Texas Intermediate Oil, Brent Oil, those are all light oils whereas the Canadian tar sands would be considered heavy oil. The Mexican oils that we're importing from Mexico are considered heavy. And the foreign oil that we import in the Gulf of Mexico to Texas refineries is primarily heavy oil coming from overseas. The sweet and sour part about oil has to do with the sulfur content. So if it has very low sulfur content, it would be considered a sweet crude, and a heavy sulfur content is considered uh, heavy crude. So the sour, uh, I'm sorry, the sour crude. So the sour crude um, sulfur is basically removed in the refining process, uh, particularly in the Gulf Coast refineries. So let's move on to refining. How is crude oil refined? Uh, this is an interesting process because there's a lot of steps that are taken um, for refining crude oil. When it's, when it's taken out of the ground, either by horizontal or vertical drilling, it's, uh, it, it's, it's brought out um, of the wellhead and treated. And uh, this would be include fracking techniques that we've refined in North America where, the, where sand and water and chemicals are introduced into the ground to, to help facilitate the fracking process. So there's a lot of non-hazardous materials that are used in the fracking process that, that translates to additional transportation infrastructure. So we have to get the water and the sand to the wellhead sites, for example, to do the fracking. The oil is removed from the ground and it's first separated from the, from the gas with a gravity separator. If you look at this first, I'm, I'm reading from left to right here. So the, the, the oil comes out of the ground, it goes through a separator. The oil and the gas are separated by gravity and then there's a heating process. These are called heater treaters. You can have either a vertical or a horizontal heater treater. And they basically further separate the oil, gas, and the water uh, by heating it up. Uh, this whole process is, is known as upstream, midstream, or downstream. So the upstream process of, of crude oil processing is the, is the part where you take it out of the ground. The midstream would be the part where you transport it, and downstream would be the part where you refine the fuel. It's further conditioned and stabilized before it's transported by, uh, by truck or by pipeline or by rail to, to refineries. And then when it's refined, it's transported uh, to market. So as you can see, there's, there's a process where you try to eliminate some of the natural gases, the, uh, and what are called NGLs, or natural gas liquids, in order to, uh, in order condition, to condition it for transport. So the, the transportation impacts of this increased availability of domestic crude oil are, are, are multifold. Uh, first of all, there's more transportation by rail, as we've learned, uh, more tr transportation by pipeline, and in the Texas area, where, where most of these um, wells are very close to refineries, there's an incredible amount of truck traffic that happens locally in North, North uh, Dakota and in Texas. Uh, 
What this means from a chemical standpoint is that you need ethane gas to make ethylene derivatives such as ethylene oxide in the chemical process, ethylene glycol is used in your, your radiator in your car, and these ethylene plants basically need uh, the ethane gas, uh, and if they can get it locally, they're going to they're going to use it locally. So I think we're going to see more of these chemical facilities built in the U.S., which means more chemical transportation of these ethylene derivatives. We've already talked about natural gas. Um, the shale oil wells include shale gas wells, so there's an incredible increase in the U.S. of of uh, natural gas and, and natural gas liquids, so that such that we're beginning to develop these LNG plants to be able to export LNG to other countries. So these are some of the impacts, and that means more rail tank barges, uh, building more rail tank cars, and specialized chemical tankers. Let's talk a little bit more about the geography in the U.S. of how the oil gets from the production areas to the refining centers. Um, that would be the next slide, uh, which shows the, the, the lower 48. If you look at this map, you can see that the yellow areas represent the production areas, and the green areas represent the refining areas. So when you're getting the oil out of the ground, let's say in North Dakota, you have some choices about where you want to where you want to get it. Do you want to send it to the Gulf Coast and try to get um, uh, the prices down there? Do you send it to Cushing, Oklahoma, by pipeline, which is where West Texas Intermediary is priced? Do you send it to the West Coast because it's shorter? Um, and try to get it to those Vancouver refineries, um, even though the price may be a little bit higher? Or do you send it all the way to the East Coast, where you get the Brent prices from the Brent crude? Uh, another option is to send it by rail to St. Louis, which has been done uh, in recent years, where it's put on a barge. You can put a unit train onto two barges and send it down the Mississippi River. There's been some of those movements as well. So. Uh, how crude oil is transported to these refineries is a, is a really depends heavily on geography, on regional market prices, and of course the cost of transportation. Uh, so there's a little, little bit of background on, uh, on how it gets to those refining centers. Why is cost significant and what's the impact on the East Coast? Why is the East Coast getting so much attention lately? Let's take a look at the next slide. And I'll tell you a little bit about why the East Coast has really benefited from crude by rail. The East Coast refineries were getting ready to close their doors in 2012. And I was at one of those meetings where they just had begun discussions with the rail carriers. Um, railroads have really provided a new option for the East Coast refineries. So if you look at this chart, this is pad one. Pad one, of course, is the east, Eastern Coast Petroleum District. And, and if you notice in in, um, in green at the bottom there, you see we've got the Canadian imports going to the East Coast. You've got some domestic pipeline, a small amount of domestic pipeline uh, travels. And then the non-Canadian imports would be the Brent oil coming from overseas in red. And look at the domestic rail numbers in blue and how they've grown from 2012 to the present day. And today, those uh, of those uh, refineries in the East, some of them are getting as much as two-thirds of their oil from Bakken today and one-third from um, these other sources. So it's really made a big difference for the East Coast. That's why I think you're going to continue to see crude by rail going east through these cities between North Dakota, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Chicago, and all the way over to Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, New Jersey, and so forth. Um, so, but what about pipelines? I've heard a lot about uh, recently that pipelines are going to take over and replace crude by rail. Um, let's take a look at the pipeline network in the U.S. Um, in addition to some of the more controversial pipeline discussions we've had, uh, such as the Keystone XL pipeline, which is this the red one you can see in the middle of the chart, there, there's a significant network of pipelines that extend today, currently, from Canada down through the Midwest to Chicago and down to the Gulf Coast. All these pipelines intersect at uh, Cushing, Oklahoma, which is the, the epicenter, if you will, of pipeline, uh, pipeline activity in the U.S., and that's where West Texas Intermediary is priced. Uh, pipelines represent a pretty significant um, infrastructure commitment, though, and they take um, more years to build than, than you could 
simply transport by rail. So I think we're going to see some continued rail traffic because of the flexibility that rail provides. And I think also because the West Coast and the East Coast are not connected by pipeline, you're, you're going to need to use the railroad. So as you can see, there's, there are no plans at the moment to send a pipeline to uh, California from, from Texas. Um, the East Coast pipelines could potentially be the Enbridge Canadian uh, pipeline that you can see in black, which would, which would help uh, alleviate some of the rail shippings once that's open. Um, but remember, you've got, um, you've got time that it takes to build a pipeline, although inherently there's fewer incidents that have occurred with pipelines than with rail, so it's a safer form of transport. So those are some examples. Uh, if you look closer at the handout, uh, you can see these are from what uh, company websites. You can see which specifically pipelines are either existing or proposed. So what's been the federal response to crude by rail? Uh, I'll touch upon this briefly uh, in three segments. Um, first of all, the, the uh, Transportation Research Board is part of the National Academy of Sciences. And they were basically formed under the uh, Lincoln administration to develop research and policy alternatives that didn't have any political implications. So you're thinking, OK, we're talking about something that's not political, and it's in Washington. That sounds like an oxymoron. But, but in fact, this is a, a very diverse group of um, industry representatives, federal agencies, um, academics, consultants. It's all volunteer. It's all open to the public. And they produce reports and, and, uh, and review papers and uh, do a lot of research. And, and my, my specialty, of course, is transportation of hazardous materials. And this subcommittee on crude oil transportation has gotten a lot of interest in the last year. It started about a year ago. I apologize for the alphabet soup here. You can see we've got lots of federal agencies, Department of Energy, Transportation, uh, human, um, DHS, uh, Homeland Security, TSA, and so forth. Um, it's been a very uh, busy committee, and uh, Transport Canada has also been very, very active. So what have we been doing? We've been hearing some presentations from some interesting um, groups. As you go to the next slide, we, we learned about some crash tests that were done by the FRA on DOT 111 and 112 tank cars. Remember, the DOT 111 tank cars are general service cars for, for, for transporting oil and ethanol and chemicals. But the DOT-112 cars, those are pressure cars that transport propane, butane, butane, and natural gas liquids. And so there's been some tests of those that were done that, um, that we learned about. Um, we heard a presentation from the University of Delaware, uh, from the DOE Sandia Labs on tight oil. We've got some more slides on that later on. I've got a few slides on the Mount Car Carbon derailment that I'll share with you. And then the EIA has uh, now been, been doing a great job compiling crude by rail data. So you can get this online now. What's the CCQTA? That's the Canadian Crude Quality Technical Association. They do a lot of research and projects uh, related to crude oil. And, and scavengers are basically chemicals that are used to introduce into crude oil to reduce hydrogen sulfide content. And, and they pre it prevents it from, uh, from going from the liquid to the vapor phase. Um, so that's an interesting technical term we learned about, uh, as well as industry trends from the API. Um, so we've got a lot of industry input to this committee. And uh, the other federal response is about the rulemaking that just happened. And, and we talked about that a little bit in the subcommittee. But uh, since there's a lot of legislation that's still under scrutiny and there's some litigation going on, we couldn't talk about it too much. Uh, but the next slide will will summarize a little bit about the U.S. DOT rulemaking. In response to to these derailments and this incredible increase to crude oil, the U.S. DOT passed a uh, some legislation in collaboration with Transport Canada just last month that became effective, and um, it basically summarizes um, new requirements for so-called high hazard flammable trains. Uh, certain speed restrictions and urban area routing, and then braking control, whether you use um, electronically controlled brakes and, and how often and when, uh, instead of the air brakes that are commonly used on trains today. You can imagine that not everybody's happy about this. The, uh, the industry would rather have longer time to phase out the DOT 111 tank cars. Uh, 
uh, legislators and first responders would like them to be phased out faster. Uh, I think the brakes are another issue where um, both industry and railroads have objected to the timeline for requiring electronically controlled brakes, and, and legislators and first responders don't think it's soon enough, particularly after some of these incidents we've had recently. And so there's a lot of back and forth about this legislation. And the other one that, um, that has come up a lot is, um, is, is, is how are these new rail tank cars going to look? They're, they've designed a new car called the DOT 117 tank car. And that has additional uh, thicker walls. It has um, shielding on, on the front and back and to extend the time that a rail tank car could be in a pool fire. The valves have been redesigned. It's really a whole, a whole new car that's been proposed. And those would be phased, uh, phased in uh, over the coming years. So that's, that's going to go a, a long way to making, um, making this safer. But at, at the same time, um, you still have a lot of heat that's involved in a, in a derailment. And um, we have some slides on that as well. Finally, the CERC notification process. This is the State Emergency Response Commission. Uh, about a year ago in, in May, the USDOT passed an emergency order requiring the railroads to notify states that are seeing more than a million gallons of Bakken crude transported through their states. Uh, and uh, and the, the onus was on the railroads to notify the CERCs. The new rulemaking puts the onus back on CERCs and fusion centers to notify the railroads. And there's been some confusion about this, but, but in effect, they're both, they're both still in effect. Um, and, uh, and that's caused, I think, some confusion between emergency managers and, uh, and states. Um, the public also wants to know about this. And, and just today, we heard from uh, Maryland that a judge just ru ruled in favor of sharing data with the media. So I think, I think the jury's uh, still out on, on how much data is going to be shared publicly on, on, this, um, on, on this topic. It's been pretty contentious. Um, so that's a little bit about rulemaking. And then uh, I'm going to try to wrap up here so we can, uh, I, can, um, I can share some of this with, with John, who's got some recommendations. This is another federal response. Uh, the, the, the federal agencies of the EPA, FEMA, and DOT sent out this, this packet to uh, all the different emergency managers around the country on preparedness initiatives and, and training opportunities. So uh, we'd be happy to get, uh, you can get more information from your emergency managers on this, uh, on hazmat incidents, Bakken oil analysis, and some uh, information about mutual aid. One of the other studies that was done on the next slide is the Sandia DOE tight oil study. Um, I've got a, a few findings from that study, and that is that it's vapors that really burn, not liquids. So remember, understanding what leads to vapor formation during transport and spill scenarios is key to understanding flammability risks. So remember, it's the vapors that we're looking at uh, more than the, than, the, than the liquid. And finally, in any um, accident scenario, Remember that enough energy will be generated to cause ignition of any kind of crude oil. It will out exceed any hydrocarbon flammability classification threshold. So in other words, derailments create a tremendous amount of energy. And regardless of what kind of a tank car you're, you have, you've got a lot of energy uh, occurring in a derailment, and it's going to do a lot of damage. So one such example is the, uh, the West Virginia derailment that, that occurred in, in Mount Carbon. Um, on the next slide, you'll see in, in February 6th of this year, there was a, a blizzard in, in, uh, in West Virginia. So the, the emergency operations center was already open. And um, while the NTSB report is not out yet on this incident, I can tell you that in, in conversations with emergency responders, that uh, they really learned uh, some, some important lessons. One, about collaborating with the railroads. These folks have trained with CSX probably four months prior to this incident occurring. And CSX railroad officials were very familiar with, with the first responders in that area. And that really helped a lot when it came to having an incident. And the second thing they learned is that, um, is that uh, one of these rail cars exploded a full eight hours after the derailment. So the derailment occurred. We had a big fire. They had to evacuate the area. There was a big pile of cars in a pile, you can see in this picture, and some pool fires burning underneath these rail tank cars. 
and there were explosions that occurred over the first four hours of the incidents. After four hours, a big period of time went by, and they waited, and they waited, and it was eight hours later that they looked at this one rail tank car that had a pool fire underneath it, and there was fire coming out of the pressure relief valve, and they said, boy, that doesn't look good, and they backed up, they stayed well away, and sure enough, that, that car exploded after eight hours, four hours after the last cars exploded. So that was a really important uh, thing to understand about the behavior of how these tank cars can behave in a pool fire. So um, at this point, I'd like to, I'd like to, to just say that um, my colleague John Steinhauer is going to talk in more detail about combustion, the combustion tree, and how this um, this combustion can occur, as well as some recommendations on um, what you can do to prepare for crude oil incidents. We'll have the next slide, and then um, John, um, over to you. Well, thank you, David, and thanks also to Brian uh, for giving me the opportunity here today. Um, let's talk a little bit about what, what happens in combustion. If you have a tank rupture, you, have, you really have two choices. Um, actually, a blevy is prior to the rupture itself, but a blevy is a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. And essentially what's happening here is all, there's enough heat generated by the fire uh, underneath or around the tank car to, to vaporize all the liquid that's contained in the car. But the liquid has nowhere to go. So it's pressurizing this tank car to the point where at some point it's going to find that weak spot. It's like putting a pin in a balloon and it's going to pop. And all of that fuel's already got the heat it needs to burn and it's already got the heat it needs to be vaporized. So all it needs now is oxygen. And these, these are poor man nuclear explosions. They are huge events. Um, and it, particularly with something that, that already is flammable. You can also have these with non-flammable things like water, uh, but they're always a big deal. So a blevy is something that uh, really is a bad deal. It's probably what happened up in Lac Megantic, um, and it killed 47 people. Um, in some cases, they couldn't even find uh, parts of these folks. So, you know, it's, it's a big deal. It takes buildings down to the foundation. A non-blevy can also be a pretty big deal. Um, you can have immediate ignition, pool fires, and flares, where basically the car's got a tear in it, it's shooting fire out the tear, or you got oil on the ground burning. And as David, David said, you know, these accidents have so much energy that anything that's gonna, that can burn can be lit. There's just that much energy involved that's converted to heat uh, in most cases. Um, delayed ignition is where you've got a vapor cloud explosion, a flash fire, uh, and potentially a deflagration or a detonation. Um, those are a pretty big deal, um, but those occur when you've got much higher level of flammable content or, or the light ends of the oil, as he was talking about earlier, uh, things that can be vaporized easily like butane, propane, and natural gas. So these combustion events have a whole variety of ways things can happen uh, during an event. So I've got a few things I want to talk about, uh, first thoughts, if you will. Um, you know, I've done well over a thousand events. You know, a lot of them silly little things on the interstate, you know, trucks and whatever, uh, having accidents and dropping diesel fuel in the local creek. But then I've been on some pretty major ones, including the Deepwater Horizon and, and others. Um, everything from radiation to white powder events. So I've got a pretty broad experience in, in dealing with these kinds of things. And what I can tell you is that all events start and end local. You know, you, there are a lot of really great resources at the state, regional, and federal levels. And these folks are awesome. And I've worked at part, as part of one of those federal teams. But I can tell you that they're not going to get there very fast in many cases, and it takes time for, for them to, to get up to speed, to get, to get there, uh, to figure out what's going on with you, and to, and to really bring those resource, resources online. So most of those responders' decisions that they make at the very first few minutes of these events have already had their impact. They've done what, you know, whatever they're going to be able to do. Um, 
And first responders, and this is really a critical point, they make decisions within the context of what they know. So if they don't know about something, if they don't understand it and haven't thought it through first or done some planning, they're going to have to try to figure it, figure it out during that event. And that takes time. And it also leads to mistakes. And we've seen these kinds of mistakes in a number of events with crude oil, but also in other substances like uh, ammonium nitrate in West Texas, where firefighters went and did some things that they probably shouldn't have done. Um, and, and they did this because they're inclined to try to do something to save lives. And that's their job, and that's what they try to do. But there are times when you need to say, wait a minute, uh, this is way past what I can deal with. Um, you know, in Loch Megantic, they didn't have the, the resources to even attempt to put out that fire. Um, they would have been better uh, used, using their time and resources to try to evacuate. Uh, but they really didn't understand what they were looking at. Uh, and, and the consequence of those decisions was the loss, a greater loss of life than would have otherwise happened. So if, if you don't have the resources to do something, back up, get the resources, evacuate people, move out of the way. And the second main thing is that, that you need to get to know folks. You know, with the railroad, with the pipelines, with the barges, um, and even some of the larger trucking companies, if, if they're local companies. Uh, get to know them, understand them. Uh, the, last time, the last place you want to meet somebody and try to figure out how they function is during an, an event. Uh, these are, these are high-speed, high-pressure events. And you know, when people have died and when there are things on fire and blowing up, you need to know that you trust the person that's working with you. So it's a good thing to get to know them up front. And that goes a long ways to help and resolve how the incident command structure functions and what you can expect. Um, learn about the tank car's strengths and weaknesses. You know, each of these cars has its strengths and weaknesses that, that are relevant to how a responder deals with it. A first responder, again, makes decisions based uh, on what they know. So if they know what to expect with a particular type of car, if they know what to expect with a particular type of barge or different kind of equipment, a pipeline, uh, then they're useful. If they don't, they can actually make a problem worse. Uh, plan for unit trains blocking large areas and requiring mutual aid. You know, these events aren't small events. And it, they, can, they can limit access to responders. They can, they can stop roads. You're talking about evacuating large areas. So you're going to have really access issues uh, to try to figure out in some of these events. Practice the incident command system. This kind of goes back to what I was saying a little bit a, a few minutes ago about uh, getting to know people. That practice really goes a long ways to allowing these systems to function. Uh, getting to know what the railroad uh, has as their resources, getting to know how they function uh, and what their response times are and how their command structure works. Uh, really spend some time to get to know them, and it, it's, it's, it'll pay off in droves if there's a real problem. Some of these events are also going to be uh, have a lot of liquids that are freed in, if they're not immediately involved in the fire. So these events may require boom operations for rivers, lakes, and coastal areas uh, that that are particularly time intensive to get put up and set up properly. So make that call early, not rather than as an afterthought. It's not just about crude oil. You know, we, sometimes we fight the last battle first. Um, you know, the crude oil issue is, is going to become a greater concern as, as communities build along these rail lines and develop uh, throughout the country as these rail lines get older. But that's, not, that's only one commodity on that rail line. You've got ethanol, chlorine, anhydrous ammonia, ethylene oxide. The list of chemicals is, is, is there are thousands in commerce. Not so many on the rail lines in, in car load quantities, but there's a lot of them out there. And, and getting to know what some of these critically, um, some of these critical chemicals are and how much is going through your community is really an important thing to understand. Uh, it, it, it's the last time you want to be trying to figure out how chlorine functions and how to deal with a chlorine leak is when you're involved in it.
So get to know what's going on down the roads, uh, down the railroads, down the uh, intercoastal waterway or the waterway, the river, whatever it is. Get to know what it is uh, and understand it. Um, it. It's you know the last time a responder wants to figure out his suit isn't the appropriate kind of suit is when he's standing in the cloud um, because then he's he's you know working to save his own life rather than someone else's. Uh, don't put sensitive populations in harm's way. As an incident commander, there are so many times I can tell you I've been at, standing next to a building or an event saying, how did we get in this situation? How did I get in a situation where I'm calling a, a, a warden of a state prison saying, is there any possible way you can evacuate that facility? And he starts laughing at me saying, son, you do whatever it takes to stop that cloud. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, I don't control the weather, um, but you know we we managed to figure out what we could do to resolve it. But that's really an, a terrible way to figure things out. You know, in many cases, you know, there's there's schools, daycares, hospitals built right on these rail lines, right on the intercoastal waterways. We have major corridors for hazmat on the interstates where we're building daycare centers right next to them. And really, you know, I've got a picture of a, a, a charter school in North Carolina uh, that is enveloped in a cloud. And it was just happened to be a Saturday morning at 9 o'clock when nobody was there. And, you know, that 90 kids that were, and teachers that would have been in that building wouldn't have survived it had it been a weekday. And it was only a matter of 100 or so feet from the facility that, that had the cloud. And you've got to ask yourself the question, why are we doing this? And what can we do to resolve it? And really, land use planning and starting to think through some of these things uh, is the way to do it. Don't put sensitive populations in harm's way. Uh, you need to know what's going through your backyard in order to, to figure this out. And you need to focus on priority hazards. You can't possibly figure out every chemical that's out there. But there are certain toxic inhalation hazards. There are some uh, chemicals that are exploding, that are reactive. There are things you know, like crude oil that are such high volumes that we need to pay attention that should be on the priority list. When you're planning, really start to think about the volume in the corridors. Um, the, the, the map on your top left, um, shows it was what I call the rainbow map. That one shows for an area uh, in one state uh, through the region that we were studying. Um, all the chemicals that were on the priority list, whether they were a rail, the dashed lines, the solid lines were highway, uh, the yellow dots were one type of uh, facility that stored chemicals, and the red dots were another type of facility. Uh, and I'm being kind of generic here because I don't want to really uh, give up too much information, uh, too much specific information. Suffice to say that what that allows us to do is the, the bottom example of showing the actual corridor by chemical and volume. Uh, so we can, sh we can show you by the, based on the width of that corridor, uh, how much of that chemical is on that corridor, um, the, the red being truck, uh, the blue being rail, uh, the purple being uh, pipeline. On the far right is a, another uh, example at a state level where we've looked at all the corridors for a particular set of chemicals. Uh, and this is one an example of one of those chemical maps. Uh, so we know the volume, we know the type of container, we know the frequency of these shipments, uh, and we, we can start to figure out uh, the kind of planning that it takes uh, to prepare for these things. Uh, you know, what do we need to do to do appropriate land use planning al along these corridors? That would include gathering information such as those sensitive populations, uh, critical uh, infrastructure, uh, sensitive environments, those kinds of things that could be seriously impacted uh, by an event along one of these corridors or from one of the fixed facilities. And this allows you to start asking the question about risk. Once you know what the hazard is, then you can start asking questions about risk. Uh, 
And once you have the risk figured out, you can start thinking through what you can do to mitigate those risks up front and then plan for those things you can't mitigate uh, and prepare your response infrastructure to deal with what's left over. You know, when you're, when you're figuring out your response capabilities uh, against the identified priority hazards which you have in your community, that allows you to dis start deciding your priorities uh, in terms of your preparedness, your planning, your training, and how you're going to move forward with all those things. If you've got the risk figured out, you can start to prepare. Um, building those strong re relationships with industry, with the regulatory agencies and local officials, and the facilities themselves that transport many of these chemicals is really something that will pay off. And finally, it gives you some critical information about the bulk track transport of some of these toxic inhalation hazards that really uh, are far more toxic than the crude oil. It allows you to realign your planning requirements uh, to, uh, to enhance your plans and the public protective actions. What you would do with one type of chemical in terms of evacuating or sheltering in place may not at all be possible with another. For example, sheltering people in a carcinogenic uh, chemical cloud is really a bad option. You can only do it for short time for immediate life saving, but long term, it's not it's not acceptable. Uh, you know, and those are things that it takes a long time to figure out during an event. So you want to know what you need to know up front. You need to identify sensitive populations in those critical facilities and how you would deal with it. Uh, for example, the idea of evacuating a hospital is simply not a pragmatic thing. Modern hospitals are loaded with folks that are really need to be there. Um, it, it's not like it used to be where people go to the hospital and spend a few days actually recovering. People today, if, if they're really, really super sick, uh, they're in the hospital. So it takes a lot of resources to move those kinds of folks out of a hospital setting. And, and, I, and I guarantee you no community has an overabundance of those kinds of resources. You know, knowing these risks provides a basis for future hazmat uh, efforts. So, you know, knowing those risk assessments and getting that information is critical for the LEPCs to function. And when a local emergency planning committee has actionable information, they actually function better. Um, in, in one state, for in North Carolina, for example, and the LEPC attendance grew by 70%. And the number of LEPCs functionally grew as well. Uh, so it, it's really important if you have good information, people start to do their jobs. Okay, David, John, thank you very much. This is Brian. Uh, I'm back again. We're going to go ahead on into the questions now. Right now it's about 2.54. Uh, we're going to do probably uh, 11 or 12 minutes worth of questions. We've got more than we're going to be able to get to today. So we'll post the answers to the other ones uh, on the website along with the recording here in a couple of weeks. Uh, but thanks again for a terrific presentation. I'm going to jump right in here. One of the first questions we got uh, was from Ryan Risden asking, asking about ECP breaking and how that's going to reduce the severity and frequency of the derailments uh, and given that some of the derailments we've had haven't been engaged, haven't been because of the ability to stop quickly. So can you talk about that one? Yeah, the, the electronically controlled brakes um, uh, would certainly send the signal faster to the brake shoes uh, to break a train. It takes it takes over a mile to stop a train, uh, regardless of the kind of brakes you have. But um, the improvements in the in the brake systems, uh, from air control brakes to electronically controlled brakes, um, were were some of the recommendations that came out of rulemaking based on the research from the from the Department of Transportation. Uh, whether or not that would reduce derailments. Um, I think it's just one of many factors that we're trying to address. Um, and so I, I don't think it would uh, necessarily reduce wholesale uh, crashes um, by themselves, but it's a collection of these recommendations that I think would, would make a difference. Um, I, I don't have a lot of technical background on braking for trains, so that's about as much as I can offer there. Um, uh, 
that's a good question for the Association for American Railroads. Okay, thanks. Okay, yep. I've got a couple of questions here that seem uh, kind of related. So, one is with regards to a levy on a typical tank car. What is the what's a ballpark for the blast radius for those kind of events? And the second similar question was, uh, what resource uh, what resources should we reference to identify first responder standoff and evacuation distance for a blevy and non blevy event? So, how far uh, how far how big can these explosions be, and how far should we evacuate from them? Yeah, John, I'm going to defer to you on this one. Thanks. Um, the answer is kind of complicated, actually. It depends a lot of the specific nature of oil in the car and uh, the amount of uh, different substances in, that are in the oil. A lot of people don't really understand that oil is a combination of many types of different uh, materials. It, it's, it's a combination chemical, if you will. And as such, the individual characteristics of the different constituent components add or subtract to the distance that a, a blevy would be uh, capable of reaching, as well as the geography and, and the type of terrain uh, that you're dealing with. Uh, so you, you can have you know, slight deviations in the terrain that would help reflect some of that energy. So as far as the distance, the safe distance to assume from a non-technical perspective, would be available in the um, DOT handbook for emergency response to chemicals. Um, the ERG is the Emergency Response Guidebook. And, you know, in a large event, um, I've seen recommendations for up to a mile as uh, is, is the, is the safe distance um, for a general evacuation. And as far as standoff distance, um, a half mile would be a reasonable distance for uh, putting your instant command post, at least initially. Thanks, John. Okay, thanks, guys. Uh, I've got a question from Steve George here asking about a specific uh, thing on slide 18. It said, can you explain the million gallon reporting requirement uh, on slide 18 of a handout? Is this a requirement for every train shipment or just the line that transports such quantities? And also, is advance notice of each shipment required? And if so, how far in advance is the report to be made? Yeah, this this came from the original uh, emergency order. Um, any any train carrying a million gallons or more of the Bakken crude oil. Uh, so railroads transporting trains carrying a million gallons or more through uh, through that state would need to notify the state. And uh, that, that type of information has basically been reported as uh, either number of trains or number of rail cars. That, that's, the, that's how the original emergency order uh, came out. Uh, initially, the, uh, the railroads were, were reluctant to respond, but did eventually provide, provide the data to the CERCs. And the CERCs then, um, state emergency response commissions then passed it along, sometimes Sometimes to the um, to the first responders that needed it in the most cases, and other times it was also shared uh, with the media. So the the, con the confusion occurred because there's now the onus is now on on the state emergency response commissions and the and the fusion centers to notify railroads and request that information for anything other than the one million gallons. So anything less than that the onus is on states and the fusion centers to notify railroads. And that's, I think, where some of the confusion came in. Okay, thanks, guys. All right, I've gonna, got a few more questions I'm going to group together. One is, when will the DOT 111A cars be phased out? And when will legislated alterations to the DOT 111A cars be phased in? Uh, also, are the older DOT 111A cars going to receive uh, alterations uh, another one about uh, asked the specifics of the tank car that exploded in West Virginia. Was it a 111 or a 117? Uh, and then finally, he says, I understand, uh, someone asked the question, I understand the last several tank car derailments involved the newest tank cars. What is to be done to address those issues? Can you answer those uh, about these tank car specifics? Yeah, I think, I think based on the amount of time we have, um, um, Brian, I think folks would, would do well to, to look at the legislation um, regarding the phase in and phase out, because it's it has to do whether it's jacketed or non-jacketed 
cars. Uh, basically, you've got DOT 111 cars, right, which is the general service tank cars. You have what's called the CPG 1232 car, which has been modified uh, and, and strengthened in, 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 in certain ways that have been jacketed and non-jacketed. So there's three types of rail tank cars currently in service, the CPG 1232 jacketed, non-jacketed, and the DOT 111s. And, uh, uh, and so uh, the, the reason um, I'm, I'm reluctant to get into a lot of detail is it's currently in, in litigation uh, on, 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 on the, well, and, and the, the time frame is, 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 um, is, is still in play. So, the, so it's, it's, I, don't, I don't have a lot of detail on the phase out process. But the, in the West Virginia accident, I will tell you that uh, that those CPG 111, uh, those CPG 1232 cars were actually in that West Virginia derailment. All of them were the CPG 1232 cars, which are uh, which are uh, more robust than the DOT 111 cars, and they still ended up uh, being compromised and had a pretty pretty significant fire with them. So it just it just reiterates the fact that you have a lot of heat generated in a derailment that uh, that can create a fire regardless of the strength of the tank car. Good. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm going to do one more, and then I'm going to wrap it up because uh, I want to make sure people get an opportunity to fill out the survey before we close it down today. But the last one would be, uh, and I, we've got way more questions than we've answered today. We'll, we'll get to those uh, via email. Thanks, for everybody, for all your questions here. The last one is, from Alan McCoy, should help public health preparedness coordinators be included in the crude rail uh, oil preparedness? Uh, absolutely, oh. absolutely. John, John's got a lot of background in, in public health. Um, do you want to speak to that, John? Absolutely. Um, one of the main constituents of crude oil is benzene, which is a carcinogen, um, and clearly that has public health implications. And there are a number of other chemicals within the con that are constituents of crude oil that have um, long-term considerations that are worth uh, public health involvement um, if, there, if there are potential exposures. Uh, so, you know, anytime you have any kind of serious chemical event, uh, public health should be part of the event. Uh, just to give you an example, I often served as either the safety officer um, or the incident commander in these events. Um, the safety officer usually um, Initially, while the firefighters did their life-saving, life-safety efforts, rescue, search and rescue, those kinds of things, firefighting. Um, but once it became a longer-term environmental thing, um, I would pick it up as incident commander. And you know, I can tell you that the public health perspective has a lot of value in helping to, de to make decisions going uh, uh, into the future for people who may have been exposed. Dave, John, I want to thank you once again uh, for joining us today. Thank you all, everybody who's on the webinar. Uh, we hit over 700 attendees on this. Thank you for participating today. We're going to continue to do these NEMA webinars. Uh, so stay tuned for what the future topics are and dates are going to be. And again, thanks everybody for participating. Have a great rest of the week.